Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Keeney. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Redmart. And I am Chris. I'm also a software engineer at Redmart. So today we're going to talk to you about an internal tool that we've developed at Redmart that we refer to as the microservice template. Uh, what this is is a tool that helps us uh, build a microservice in one step. Uh, that way we can create microservices faster, and it also helps us abstract away a lot of the configuration and server setup that needs to happen for every new service that we create. So today's presentation is going to be split into four pieces. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of history about Redmart and why this became necessary, and also about the microservice template itself and how it's evolved. And then we're going to talk about the microservice templates, and then two pieces that it, two critical pieces that it relies on. One is the something we call the microservice library, and then the microservice test library, which helps test things. So first, to establish some context, uh, let's talk about what microservices are. Uh, first, you can see what they are not on the left side. Does this thing work? Nice. Uh, on the left side there, uh, this is how most uh, services start out. You just have one giant server that handles all your traffic and all your logic. And, uh, but as your business grows, you start to accumulate more and more business logic inside this one server. And you can deploy more and more of them, put them behind a load balancer to handle traffic. But eventually, it becomes really tedious and cumbersome to deploy all these. And if you have one small piece of your logic that's taking up a lot of memory or a lot of CPU, then deploying a giant server just to handle one small piece of business functionality doesn't uh, make a lot of sense. So splitting up into microservices um, helps scale things. Uh, and so you can see that uh, microservices are small, independently deployed services that are based around uh, independent pieces of business functionality. And so the UI just calls a single service. It doesn't really know who. And then they just do their own small chunk of work. And if they need to call other services, then they can do that. And they end up forming their own ecosystem, uh, similar to what Surya was just presenting. So uh, how do we get here? Well, it's a tale as old as time. Uh, developer meets API. Developer falls in love with API. API is unable to scale to meet the love of the developer. And so the developer decides to do something about it. When we first looked at our monolithic API implementation, uh, we had several distinct pieces of business functionality. They were already pretty well segregated into packages and whatnot. But uh, they had a lot of common code that was being reused, uh, a lot of uh, helper libraries and utility functions. And uh, there was a lot of uh, configuration and server setup that went into the initial application. So we did our best to split up uh, a couple pieces of the business functionality into their own services. Uh, and when we did this, we noticed that uh, you know, we were able to isolate the business functionality pretty well. Uh, there was a little bit of duplicated common code. And of course, the database configuration and the server setup was duplicated as well. So the way that we created these first microservices was a little tedious, uh, a little uh, error prone. We had to first manually create a new play project. And then we would have to find a, a working service and copy the continuous integration setup as well as uh, the database configuration and other server setup files. Uh, this was problematic because there could be older versions of uh, frameworks that were in use, and then the uh, configuration values would either be in the wrong format or the wrong naming schema. And uh, some of them just wouldn't work. And then in addition to the configuration files, we also had to copy some actual Java files as well. And again, this was problematic if we were using older versions of frameworks between different services. Uh, sometimes between different versions of play, they wouldn't even call the same classes on startup. And so you could copy your configuration over, and it just wouldn't even be there. And it was really hard to debug why. So there wasn't a single source of truth for where you could find uh, the latest version of the frameworks we're using uh, configured correctly. So we looked at the microservices that we would created. And we combined them into the first version of the microservice template. So this had, instead of actual business functionality, just some sample functionality to get you started. Uh, it had references to uh, the common code, a lot of the third party libraries that we were using. And it had uh, stable versions of the latest version of our continuous integration and uh, server setup scripts. But this still had a problem, because we noticed that uh, when we would make changes to the microservice template, it was really difficult to make sure that those changes propagated to other services that we'd already created from the microservice template. And also, if anyone had a really cool idea that they implemented in their own service, again, it was difficult to propagate that to other services. So the second version of the microservice template uh, only has sample functionality, and then it includes the microservice library. 
And then inside the microservice library, we abstracted away all the uh, common duplicated code as well as uh, all the configuration setup. So now keeping things in sync is just as easy as increasing your uh, dependency version. So let's talk about the template. What is it? Uh, it's a fully functional sample service. On the screenshot on the right side, you can see uh, the folder setup of the structure. And uh, it has an app folder that has all the actual production code. Uh, there's a test folder that has integration and unit tests set up uh, into their own folders. Uh, there's a build.spt file that Play uses to deploy itself. And two lines below the highlighted one, you can see newproject.sh, which is what the template uses to duplicate itself and create a new service for you. Uh, so all the uh, sample code also includes some uh, dependency injection setup so that uh, it's a lot easier to get started coding the actual logic you want in your server. So we've mentioned the continuous integration setup a couple of times. So I want to talk about some of the tools that we use during continuous integration. Uh, the first one that we use is a plugin called Jococo. It's a Java test coverage tool. So it'll uh, listen while you run your tests, and then it'll give you a report on uh, how effective your tests were at covering different branches and different lines in your code. And the cool thing is that it'll fail your build if there's not enough tests to cover uh, the metrics that you want. Uh, next, we use uh, a plugin called FindBugs, which does just what the name says. It finds bugs in your code. Uh, it does some static analysis on your code, and uh, it'll fail to build if it finds any uh, glaring uh, bugs. CheckStyle makes sure that all of our code follows the same readability standards. Uh, if you use tabs instead of spaces, or if you use four spaces instead of two, it'll fail your build. Sorry if you feel otherwise. Uh, SonarCube is a plugin that we use to comment on our GitHub pull requests. And that, that again, uh, finds any obvious flaws that are missed by the other three. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, Surya mentioned that we have our own uh, Nexus repository, but that's hidden behind a firewall. And so for the continuous integration server to actually be able to build our builds, it needs to SSH into the firewall and be able to access things. So there's some uh, scripting setup to allow that to happen. Uh, inside the microservice template, we also have a standardized login configuration uh, that's used across all services. Uh, we make sure that we're always logging the timestamp in a certain format. Uh, the name of the service is generating the log entry, the currently executing thread ID, uh, the request ID. Uh, the request ID is uh, we generate a unique identifier that matches incoming requests from the front end. Uh, we're going to touch on that in a couple of slides throughout here, and then we'll sh show you a cool graph how it all plays together in the end. Uh, and then we also log all this in pretty colors. So you can see at the screenshot at the bottom there that uh, different pieces have uh, different colors and draw your eyes to different pieces. So the code that was abstracted away into the microservice library uh, is mainly focused around uh, setting up the external resources that we use. So the vast majority of our services use Mongo as their database. The regular majority of our services use Redis for a key value store. And then a good number of our services also use RabbitMQ for messaging functionality. So we have uh, a lot of uh, setup that's abstracted away into the microservice library. And we also have some dependency injection modules that make it very easy to quickly inject any clients you need to interact with these services. So for RabbitMQ, we have uh, a standardized publisher, a standardized consumer. And we also make sure that when the server exits that all your connections are closed gracefully. Uh, for Redis, we have a lot of connection pooling set up. We automatically monitor several uh, metrics and stati statistics using StatsD. And depending on the type of programming you're using, we have a synchronous, asynchronous, and reactive clients that you can use. And we also make sure that uh, content is serialized in a standardized way. Uh, for Mongo, we have a really cool helper annotation that will automatically increment certain fields whenever you save an object. This is useful for things like automatically generating IDs. And we also have Morphia integration set up by default. Uh, Morphia is just an ORM between Java and Mongo. We also have a web service client that we use to make uh, external or internal network calls. And so this was originally built as a wrapper around Play's static web service client. But over time, uh, it uh, grew a life of its own, and we added more functionality to it as well. Uh, in the diagram here, you can see that whenever it makes a request, the first thing it does is it logs the request URL and any header information that's relevant. And then it also adds some custom headers to every request. 
And then once the response comes back from the magical cloud, it logs the HTTP status and how long we were waiting for the response to come back. Uh, some of the headers that we forward for every request are Redmark specific. Uh, the X request ID is related to the request ID that we saw on the logging slide. Uh, and that's necessary uh, so that the logging is uniform across all of our services. Whoops. Uh, and so Play's controllers are set up on an uh, action and filter composition model. And so it's really easy to insert your own filters into that design. So we created a lot of uh, filters that we insert into all of our controllers by default. Uh, these do a lot of similar logging as the web service client. Uh, we log the request URL and headers, HTTP status, and how long it took. Uh, we also make sure that uh, any incoming headers that are missing that are required are there. So just how the web service client always forwards the X request ID, the uh, incoming request filter makes sure that an X request ID is generated if it's not there. And then finally, the response header modifications. Uh, there are a couple headers that are used in some of our internal services and some of our front end clients. And so this makes sure that those headers are always present for every response that we send out. And then finally, we make sure that uh, there's some automatic metrics logging for uh, the response status and the timing. <coughs> But there's also a lot of other cool metrics that we track, and Chitra will tell you more. Um, seem to have skipped. Sorry, <laughs> I gave it all away. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Anu. So I'm going to be talking about some of the other interesting stuff in the microservice library, as well as in the microservice test library. Uh, so first up is metrics. Uh, metrics are a great way to figure out uh, what's happening in your system, to identify any performance bottlenecks, or to get alerted in case something goes wrong. So what the microservice library does is it automatically collects some of the most commonly used metrics across our services. So for one, so for any request which actually comes into the service, it keeps track of what the response status is, as well as how long those res that this request took. For any request which your service makes to a different service, it does the same. It also keeps track of uh, JVM metrics, such as CPU or memory, and other connection-related metrics. So the library also makes it pretty simple for a service owner to customize the metric name just by using annotations. And if they want to collect their own custom metrics, they can just use an injected statsd client and get started. So this is just a very simple dashboard of one of our services on Grafana. So as Surya mentioned, we use basically StatsD, Graphite, and Grafana. Uh, there are already a couple of interesting things over here. So for one, like here you can see that we're logging the response times, and it's pretty obvious that there's a big spike there. So this is an uh, ideal candidate for when you might want to get alerted that, OK, maybe something is actually up with your services. The other thing interesting here is like if you look at the memory metrics, you can see these drops, so those actually correspond to the time when there was a garbage collection on the service. So metrics are great to get an overall idea of the system and uh, to detect any anomalies, but in certain cases, we really need to look at specific requests. Uh, so as an example, uh, let's consider a case where a customer is trying to place an order on the Redmart site, but something goes wrong and the order is not created as expected. At that point, we really need to track what exactly happened within that uh, request. Uh, but since we have a microservice architecture, there's like a ton of services which are involved whenever we create an order. And without any way to track what's happening and to correlate across services, it can get really hard. So that's where request tracking comes in. Uh, so what the microservice library does is the first time someone places a request into, the serv uh, into our system, uh, the library generates a unique request ID. So this is uh, set at the X request ID header, which Daniel mentioned before. So subsequently, when service one is calling service two, it makes sure that the uh, web service client in the library actually passes along this request ID too. Uh, not just for calls across services, uh, when the service one is publishing a message to a queue which is being consumed by a different service, uh, the RabbitMQ publisher within the library makes sure that the request ID is a part of the message, and the consumer knows how to get the request ID and use it. So now that all the services actually have the request ID, when we look at ELK and we want to diagnose what actually happened, we just need to figure out what the request ID is. And then across services, you can get all the logs you need. 
So with the microservice library, we have also changed the way we do error handling. Uh, so by default, the play framework returns HTML errors. Uh, but those are not really useful for us, since most of our clients do their own UI rendering. So what the microservice library does is it replaces all the HTML errors with JSON errors. And uh, on an alpha or a staging environment, it also includes details about the actual exceptions as well as the stack trace. So those can be really useful when you want to debug some issues. So just an example of how it would have looked like before. So basically, you have no idea what's happening. Uh, but with a JSON kind of format, you get to see what the request was, what were the headers, what was the actual stack trace of the exception. One other way in which the microservice library alerts you if, there's an, if anything goes wrong is through a Slack appender. So what this does is that uh, you can configure your uh, service to return, to give you, send you a Slack notification on a particular channel whenever there's a log message which crosses a particular threshold. So for example, if you get an error, if there's ever an error logged in your service, you can get a Slack notification for it. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about the microservice test library. So most of the functionality in the test library is focused about uh, around making it easier to write integration tests in our services. So the Play framework does have an integration test class, which uh, starts up a server for you. And you can also call endpoints through it. However, we found it quite clunky to use. So what we have done is we've written a wrapper around Play's integration test. And this sets up all the application level configuration which is needed for the tests. So we also have helper end methods which help you call endpoints on the running service. In a lot of cases, we need to have some kind of test data set up. Uh, so what we have in the test library is a helper which will basically load test data from JSON into your running databases. The other interesting thing is a test watcher which basically adds markers into your log outputs. Uh, so whenever a test starts, passes, or uh, fails. And this makes it easy to identify if a particular test is, is failing. You can just focus on that test to know what the logs for that test. Nope. <laughs> um, so the other thing which Daniel had mentioned before was that we use a ton of external resources. And when we are writing our tests, we also want to be able to test those. Uh, but in a lot of the scenarios, we don't want to actually connect to the staging environment. So what we do instead is use embedded resources. So there are a number of third-party uh, embedded resources available for the ones we use, so for RabbitMQ, Redis, and for MongoDB. Uh, but it's pretty cumbersome to set up because you need to have like a setup and teardown for each class in which you want to use those resources. Uh, with the microservice test library, we have kind of abstracted away all of that. And you can basically just use JUnit rules and set up the, include the embedded resources which you want to. Uh, we've also made sure to have unique data stores and we automatically do the cleanup after each test. So we've seen uh, the template, we've seen the library, we've seen the test library. Uh, but the presentation was titled Creating a Microservice in One Step. And how do we actually do that? Uh, it's pretty simple. So basically, we just run one shell script, uh, and that does everything for us. So what this shell script does is it gets the latest version of the microservice template from GitHub. Uh, it renames all the placeholders based on the service name which you want. It builds the project and runs all the tests to make sure everything is still working fine. And it sets up a new Git repository. And if you want, it can even push the changes for you. And at the end, you basically have a fully functional service with all of the external resources and dependencies set up, uh, with logging set up the right way so that you can visualize it on Kibana, uh, with the proper metrics collection uh, so you can basically see all of it on Grafana and get alerted as well. And that's it. Thank you.